Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Um, We have a lot coming up in the next few weeks. Excuse me for a second. (coughs) I'm all choked up about it. Um, We have a lot coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, First of all, next week, uh, Kim Montenegro, the director of spiritual life at UOP, will be preaching for us, which is going to be great. We will also be celebrating the service. So you have to say this just right. We are going to celebrate the gifts and the service of our beloved Martha Tipton. We are not celebrating her retirement as though, oh, you're gone, yay. This is a, you're gone, boo-hoo, but yay that you are starting this next adventure, Martha. So next week after worship will be that fabulous celebration, and thank you for her fabulous ministry in our midst these years. And so... Uh, I hope you folks will do that. Um, And then as if that weren't enough, after that, the joy of annual conference will begin. You all can live stream it from wherever you are and enjoy that. But uh, I want to make a special note that um, during annual conference, um, Pastor V. Seth will be received into full uh, communion, full membership in the annual conference as a pastor. This will be, I think, by recognition of orders. And so we're going to want to make a time to celebrate him and that milestone. This is the culmination of a long and wonderful journey, and we're thankful for his ministry with our Cambodian brothers and sisters. And so acknowledging that and uh, tuning in for that would be great. And if you can't tune in, don't worry. It will be recorded. You can watch it. But above all, let's celebrate Pastor V. Seth's achievement Uh, when that vote takes place. It is high time, I must say. My only regret now at being excused from annual conference is I will not be there to vote for my brother V. Seth uh, as he enters into this new relationship uh, in the United Methodist Church. And so I will expect all of you to be giving him a hearty welcome back when conference is over and uh, a big thank you and celebration of that journey as well. So there's a lot happening. Um, In addition, today, after worship, just to entice you to hang around a while, I understand there's root beer floats. I did see the ice cream. So, yeah, I hope you'll all make it for that. And, of course, this is my last Sunday preaching, which is always a mixed bag for the preacher. So um, if I get teary, I don't have Kleenex, but somebody will, I'm sure, um, and we'll all just have that uh, moment together. Um, But above all, I want to thank you for a year that has been a blessing, and I pray that this next hour of worship will continue the blessing of our journey together, um, even as we sort of enter into a new phase. With that, let me also welcome those who are joining us online, whether it is right now or later in the week. We are blessed to have you a part of our community and thankful for your presence with us. So friends, with all of that before us and in our minds for what's to come, let us pause for a time of prayer together as we begin. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is a blessing to be gathered anew and afresh for worship. In the week that has passed, much has happened. We lay it at your feet. For the week to come, we pray that you will Be with us and bless us with your presence that we might be disciples of your Son, drawing nearer and bringing about your reign in this earth, in this place, in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, I want you to uh, invite you, rather, to stand as you are willing and able for our first hymn, Draw the Circle Wide.
Please be seated. We invite all the children to come up. Well, today is Pastor Mark's last Sunday, and I'm sorry if this is a swear word in your home, but that kind of sucks. S-U-C-C-S. And so the children would like to present you, Pastor Mark, with this succulent. But in true Mark Cord style, first we want to talk about it a bit. Uh, this succulent got planted yesterday. It includes a jade, because we're very lucky to have had you, Mark. And that jade actually stems from the same jade that's planted outside from Robbie. This includes a euphoria, which is what I call the succulents that I can't pronounce, which I think are actually called echolatias. Uh, because they're so stable. You can put it in a pot and it will grow whether you water or not in our climate. And it includes the tall guy that I learned yesterday its name, but I'm going to call it an amoeba because I can't remember that name either. Because from this tiny little stem, it will grow up and it will create tons of other stems. And that is what we know you will do in this world. Today's scriptures are about the people who said, we played the flute and you did not dance. We sang and you did not sing with and I think as Americans today as world citizens we know that we can't control everything we can think we've done something glorious and then it doesn't work out and you kids who have gotten to have Pastor Mark with you for one year can already see in the succulent all that will grow from that time we've had you with you Mark and so just like 
the plants. Let us remember that whether someone's touching them or not, whether we're watering them or not, whether we know what we're doing or not, God has a plan for us. And so let us live in this glorious world wherever we go, knowing how he's touched us and how we've touched each other. Who would like to hold this plant and bring it over to Pastor Mark? Okay, let's see who can lift it. It's glass. We've got to be careful, right? Charlie's got it. Why don't you all walk? Oh, Charlie, do this way. Go right to Pastor Mark. Trust. Thank you. Children, you guys can walk up the aisle, and Alan will bring you to the nursery if you want to play today outside. I don't know, I was kind of ready to sit with my buddy right there and just kind of hang out a while. Our scripture won't be read without my glasses. <coughs> it is from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 11th chapter, 16th through the 19th verses. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another. We played the fruit for you. And you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Friends, I want to invite you to join in our second hymn, In Loving Partnership. And again, if you would stand and sing as you are willing and able. be seated. Our reading is from the first chapter of Acts, the first through the 11th verses. The first paragraph is kind of a prologue, since Acts is supposed to be the companion book with the gospel according to Luke. So treat it as a, a kind of a side, if you will, and then the narrative begins a little further down in that second paragraph. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave to Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that God has set by God's own authority. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two two men in white robes stood by them and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May the Lord bless the hearing of the scripture.
Let us pray, friends. May the words of our mouths, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a discussion in our household about automobile use. This involved a 23-year-old, two parents, and an 11-year-old. Because really, whenever three or more are gathered in a family of four, the fourth is automatically included in whatever the conversation is. But there was this discussion of use of car, and the, the prim primary driver of it was that um, the person in question didn't want to drive my car. What's wrong with my car? It's a pretty cool car, if I do say so myself. Yes, it's always dirty. Did I say there were two members of my family who are both not the adults involved in this, and they're why there's permanently sand and food etched into the upholstery and floor of my car? No, of course not. No responsibility for that. I don't want to drive your car. I don't like your car. It's, it's funny shaped. It's, we went through the whole thing. Turns out that the real issue is that the driver's side mirror got broken about three years ago. Yes, I'm that guy. And so there's this much of the mirror that works great, and then the rest of it is this sort of shattered bits and pieces that you can't use. And I, of course, have adapted to using my rear view mirror with just this limited bit. I adjust it, and it works just fine, and I just never seem to get around to fixing it, and it's okay. I've not had any left side crashes, but it turns out for other people driving my car, they can't make that work. They need a full mirror. I pointed out to that person that their only crash involved them driving front ways into a curb, but that didn't seem to help. It's funny how we see things, right? At a certain age, uh, I entered into uh, one day I could read, and the next day I couldn't read without glasses. Maybe some of you had that experience. For those of you who haven't, it might be coming your way sometime soon or not so soon. But one day I could read, and the other day I couldn't read. The thing that now is true about me and my glasses, as you just noted not a couple minutes ago, I'm useless at reading without my glasses. And they are of absolutely no use to anybody else as glasses. I mean, we might get close, but it'll be uncomfortable, a little bit painful even, could give you a headache. Actually, I have to wear my glasses. What I see is not what you see. It's always going to be a little bit different. And to me, the fascinating part of this text in Matthew is Jesus is essentially taking people to task for what they see and what they don't see. What they notice and what they don't notice. What causes them to pay attention or not to pay attention. What do we see? What do we notice? What do we pay attention to? I was very struck this week as I was hoping for a break from the terrible, tragic news of the day by tuning in to a basketball game to see an NBA coach, Coach Kerr, give an absolutely brilliant, impassioned statement about the unity of the American people around some issues that are front and center before us right now. We are not a divided people on some of these issues. Overwhelmingly, we agree on certain things that ought to be the case that simply are not the case. But this is not a, a big debate that we're having when 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on the poll, all agree on the same thing. It's no longer a giant debate. It's actually a settled matter. And the other percentage that isn't really there needs to deal with the fact that we're allegedly a democracy and it should matter that the overwhelming majority wants something different. If all I watch is the news, I get these perceptions that there's nothing but vast chasms of separation around me, that I'm on my own, that I'm isolated, that I'm, I'm, I'm set aside. I'm told daily that I don't fit in and I don't matter unless I conform to certain kinds of things. And none of it is really all that true. 
I was sharing at the 8.30 service that one of the things I loved about coming to Stockton was getting to know Stockton again because it had changed a bit from when I knew it before in the 80s, but not all that much. But I loved getting to know it again. And one of the things I came to love about Stockton, it really, I mean this in a very sweet and genuine way, is the way that Stocktonians all have a chip on their shoulder about Stockton. It's awesome. And like as soon as people find out I'm not from Stockton, there's this sort of, well, you know, <coughs> Stockton. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, my sister lived here for 30 years. I'm down with Stockton. Like we don't have to rehearse it. I actually like the food better in Stockton than I do in San Francisco. Honest, I swear it's okay. Can I help you rebalance the chip though? Just a little quick. Right? Like if, if all I see are headlines about Stockton. I don't know anything about Stockton. Jesus, in this passage, is asking people to stop and really look at what is right in front of them, which in this case turns out to be him and what he means. Which brings us to Acts. Right? The expectation of Jesus' ministry is that he's the Messiah. And what that means for people in Jesus' time is the restoration of the nation of Israel, the reconciliation of the world, the fulfillment of prophecy, that the globe becomes, in a sense, a garden for God and God's people again, that all people on the earth are blessed through those who the original blessing has been given to and all will be made whole and right. And Jesus, for his entire ministry, doesn't ever seem to get around to doing that. And they keep asking. Often the disciples ask in the most inappropriate ways. Jesus, when you're king, what cool job do I get? Or surely I am better than this disciple over here, and so I should get the neater position in the reign of God. And Jesus is always like, Ay, you knucklehead, stop it. Focused on all the wrong things at all the wrong times. So here Jesus has died horribly, been resurrected demonstrated who he is in a new way, and what is their question? I mean, at some point, you have to imagine Jesus just like the resurrected Jesus standing there rolling his eyes at, is now the time when your kingdom is going to come again? Is this the moment when it'll be the way we want it to be? When it'll be like we expect, like all the promises you've given us, is this it? Is this the now when, when the magic happens and I don't really have to do much? Because I really love it when things are great and I didn't have to work for it. When by fiat it arrives, it'll be amazing. And Jesus basically says, you don't get to know when. You don't get to know when. Elijah's 11 years old, and we are currently in that phase of 11-year-old-ness where Elijah occasionally will come up to me and open his mouth and go, look. And I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at because a tooth fell out last week and there's a new tooth breaking in, and I'm sorry, I, it, maybe it's my poor eyesight without my glasses, but I can't actually see a tooth wiggle when you go, So I don't know what I'm supposed to look at. And I say, Elijah, I, I, what am I seeing here? It looks like you got a tooth coming. He's like, no, no, the one that's moving. I'm like, it's not moving, son. It's, no, it's moving. Oh, okay, Wh which, why don't you point at it for me? Dad's kind of old and is having trouble spotting this. It's this one right here. When do you think it's going to fall out? I don't, I don't know. When God says it's ready to fall out. Or when you're asleep. Those seem to be the two options. We don't get to know about the fulfillment of things. What we get to do is what Jesus is asking us to do, which is a kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? What does Jesus ask of the disciples at this great moment? What does Jesus say to the people of Jesus at that moment? What's the invitation? Does anybody remember?
Let me see. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Oh, power. We all love power, don't we? That idea that we have, I'm really comfortable with the idea of, you know, me and people like me having power. I'm not so comfortable with other people having power, and some people with power I don't like, and I like to critique their power. We are not a people that is entirely comfortable with the idea of power. Yes, power can allow for good things to happen. Power can involve the exercise of goodness shared broadly across all people. God's power is manifest throughout the world. We just have to look and see it. I love the demonstration of God's power that occurs every couple of weeks at my house when the plants again grow up in the seams of the concrete of the driveway and of the uh, sidewalk out front. And I get to say, Minion, oh, Elijah, chore time, buddy. And I hear the scrape of the shovel scraping off all those plants because if they grow too big they crack the concrete and then the city sends me a nice letter and I have to replace the sidewalk and I'd rather pay my kid two bucks to go out and scrape it off than I'd like to spend a couple thousand replacing the sidewalk. But you know, even pavement can't stop God's creation from sprouting new life. It's funny, the church van hasn't moved in a while. Have you noticed the plants growing up under it? We can't by our own power, prevent God's good creation from trying to break through what we keep putting in its way and manifesting new life. It is like a reminder that what God intends is new life and growth and creative power in the world. And everything we do to constrain it will work for a while until it doesn't. And it won't fail in a big spectacular way. It'll fail one little sprout at a time. You are to be given power, not the kind of power where you storm in and make everything different one day, but the kind of power that cracks and breaks its way through the hard places in your heart, in your neighborhood, in your life, in your city, in your state, in your town, each according to your call. You are given this power of life that bursts through all of the obstacles placed in its way, even sometimes the obstacles that you have within you. You will be given that kind of power. That's the Jesus power. All of Jesus' metaphors are about planting and growing and harvesting and fruitfulness. This is not spectacular, bold, I'm going to drive a tank down the street kind of power. This is the kind of exercise of power that takes time and nourishment and the change of seasons to make it amazing and breathtaking and transformational. This is your power. You will be given power from the Holy Spirit, from God. Not just clergy, maybe especially not clergy, actually. Maybe mostly not clergy, maybe it's entirely your power and we're just here to invite you to use it. Maybe we have it wrong. You will get power from the Holy Spirit. God will speak to you in the way of life and love and compassion and grace and you are that vehicle, that seed, that salt, that leaven, all of the good things. Why are you just sitting here? God has something for you to be up to. And then the next invitation that comes quickly on to that is you will be my witnesses. I don't get to serve on juries. Mixed blessing, I guess. It's been my experience in jury service that when I get to a certain point and they find out I'm clergy, that begins to trouble people, so then they begin to ask me questions like, you know, well, are you going to follow the law? And I always have to say, yes, I will absolutely follow the law to the extent to which the law is just. Right. Dismiss. Thank you very much. I have always sort of wanted to flirt with the contempt citation as I walk out the door sort of saying, what does it mean that this whole process isn't about justice? I'm just curious. But I feel that I can't afford the fine. The day in jail I'm up for, but fine not so much. Witnesses. 
I'd like to think that you're all good people and that if invited to give witness testimony on something that you didn't see or experience, you would say, I don't know anything about it and I can't help you. I'd like to think we could all agree at that basic standard. This isn't like the household argument or, you know, I don't know, but I know you did it. Like, it's not that kind of a thing. This is actually, if you didn't see it, you haven't experienced it, you don't talk about it. So my question for you is, what are you witnessing to Jesus having done in your life, in your community, in our world? Where is it that you find witness to share? I have yet to go to a church, and I've ser served in churches, as I've done the math recently, for almost 30 years. And in all of those years, everybody always asks me, what can we do to grow the faith? What can we do to grow our church? And I have to tell you that I think Jesus is right. What you have to do is witness to it. Witness to what it is that God has done in your life, that Jesus has done in your life, in our community, in the ways in which God has impacted us and then sent us out into the world. Witness to that and people will want to be a part of it. I used this example at the 830 service. I'm going to use it again. I don't like flying. Yes, I'm going to fly to go on vacation. This will not be fun. I'm planning on taking a prescribed sleeping pill to manage my anxiety through snoring for a portion of the flight. I'm a weak person. It's the best I can do. The other reason I don't like flying is because it seems like a lot of the times I've flown, I end up sitting next to somebody who wants to talk to me. I don't like flying. I'm uncomfortable. I'm frightened. And now you want to talk to me? Oh. It got better with iPads and iPhones and digital devices where most people check into their, their own worlds, just never in my row. And so inevitably the question is, what do you do? And I don't want to talk about what I do. Because when I talk about what I do, the conversation becomes all about what I do. I've explored thinking about doing other things. I'm an international spy. No, that's not going to work. So the last time I tried, I sat down a flight person, you know, we're talking and I'm trying to get out of the conversation repeatedly. It's not where the person says, what do you do? He says, you know, I work for a global enterprise that seeks to promote human health, the thriving of families, multi-generational uh, communities that allow for people to explore their gifts and be out in the world in a meaningful way. Wow, that, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Does, do, what else do you do? You know, and I start to go through it. You know, I'm, uh, we do international service after disasters, but we don't do the kind where we parachute in and get our picture taken with a shovel. We do the kind where we're there for months and even years working with people in local communities to fix and repair the things that they say are important. We don't come in and tell them what they need. We come in and ask them what they'd like us to do for them, and we serve those needs, and we do it in culturally appropriate ways that allow for them to be participants, even partners in their rebuilding and the reinvigoration of their community. We don't come self-supporting entirely because we want to put money in the local economy and encourage people to rebuild the sinews of their community that have been harmed by natural disasters. That is amazing. I've always been looking for It's great stuff, I've got to tell you. What else do you guys do? Oh, we run youth programs. We run older adult programs. We have programs that visit people. I can't, this is the most amazing company ever. Where can I, you know, where can I go to experience? See, there's 35,000 United Methodist churches in, in the United States. Any one of them will do. Wait, what? <laughs> See, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a minister. Hold up. You know, I'm, I'm not Christian. Oh, God, this is why I don't like anybody knowing I'm a minister. That's great. Don't be a Christian. Like, I'm not here to make you a Christian on this plane flight. Matter of fact, if I'm honest with you, I'm having a crisis in my own faith right now because I don't like flying. You guys really do all that? We try. We try. Why is it so hard for us to witness in the world in a real way about how it is that our faith, our community, not just used to have impact, but still has impact? 
not just used to do stuff, but imagines a future of doing more stuff. It can't just be about all the things that once happened. It has to be about the things that are going to happen next. It has to be about what's happening right now. The faith that just talks about that great experience I had 35 years ago on a mountaintop, that's a faith that's kind of frozen. A faith that talks about how, the, how God touched my life yesterday when I was with a gathering of people and I watched somebody do something amazingly compassionate for someone they didn't know. And in that moment of compassion, I saw the reign of God in our midst, right here, right now. I didn't have to ask for identity cards. The work of Christ was being done by those people who were actually doing it. The moments that draw you here, that keep you here, that hold you here, why can't you tell that story in the community? And the invitation isn't for you to go around the world and tell the story. The invitation in the text is for these folks to do it right where they are. One of the things I'm going to be saying goodbye to, much to my disappointment, in the next couple of weeks is the taco truck I've been visiting twice a week for the last year. They don't know I'm leaving yet, and I'm really not looking forward to that conversation. It was my second or third week, and I ordered a burrito and, uh, you know, went to my car did what you should never do, got in the car, started to drive, unwrapped it, started to eat. Because nothing models healthy humanity like taking time for a meal behind the wheel of your car on Pacific Avenue. And I'd gotten about two blocks and I realized the burrito was amazing. It was so good. They drove back. And I go up there with half my burrito, you know, probably some burrito smeared on me. And I'm like, your food's amazing. It's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm like, no, this is really great. Like, I, I'm a former chef. I want to talk to you about how you do, like, is it a secret how you prepare? You? Like, and we got into this lengthy food conversation, you know, at the food truck while they're still serving people. And, I'm, and the person's finally like, well, what do you do? Do you still do restaurants? I say, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Methodist minister. I serve at the big church across from UOP. And I could see the moment of like, uh-oh. Have you seen that moment? That, uh and I said, you know, here's what I love about what you do. You just put together a burrito, and it's amazing. And I get how amazing it is. So amazing that it made me drive back to tell you how great your food is and how much I enjoy it. If you stopped at my church on any given Sunday for worship, I'd hope you'd have an experience like that. I can't promise it, I can't guarantee it, but that would be my hope, that something would happen for you significant enough for you to want to go back and tell somebody, wow, that was really great and amazing, and that happened. That's witnessing. She witnesses through her food as to God's good creation, and I can't help but go back again and again and again. If you see me in Stockton in, 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 con, in, in breaking the rules about me not being around for a year, it's because I'm going to be sneaking to that taco truck. You'll got a burrito in hand, snap a picture for the bishop, it's fine, I'm willing to do the time on that one, because it's worth it. That's witnessing. It's witnessing is you being you, but being honest about how you connect to God and how God connects to this church and how this church connects back to the community in ways that make a difference. Next week is Pentecost where you celebrate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I hope when you come here, you have in mind some way that God touched your life through the ministries and people of this church and that this church has touched this community through its ministry. I was part of an online conversation about the terrible tragedies of this last couple of weeks. And somebody had made a list of all the school shootings since Columbine. And Alan Cook, out of nowhere, comments, you know, this goes back further all with the way to Cleveland School when there was that playground shooting. And where was this church then? Right there, side by side, with those folks doing the hard work of planting the seeds of grace and love in a community that was torn apart by violence. You know what it's like to have been there, and you have something to offer to this discussion and this debate to the extent that we're even having one about a better way forward forward than what we've done and darn it you owe it to the world to get to work the reign of God doesn't crash down one day and we all get it Woohoo! it actually takes us participating in the building of it because that's how it appears 
It appears in your life, in your world. You point it out to other people who see it, who want more of it, who do the work to get us there. If you expect it to happen magically, it's never going to arrive. But if you do the work of discipleship, it's always around you. You'll bump into it everywhere. You'll see it and taste it and feel it. And you'll want more and you'll invite others to it. I've never had a path for the future. I've never been the kind of pastor who says, oh yeah, if we do these 10 things, we'll be 10 times as big in 10 years. I'd actually be much more interested in what it would be like for us to grow our faith and watch what comes from doing that because you are the only witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. It's you. Oh, there's other churches that do it too. But for all intents and purposes, here and now, in this place, it's you. You are God's witnesses in the world. And I promise you, if you don't tell God's story, nothing changes. And if you do tell God's story from your heart, well, that's a resurrection thing. Amen. I want to ask you to uh, pause for just a time of prayer, if you would. So let us pray. Gracious God, we are your gathered people. We are your witnesses. We are your church. We pray for the coming of your spirit afresh and anew, that we might again be propelled out into our Jerusalem, our neighborhood, and our world to bring about your reign. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that we were taught by your Son, our God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, part of what we do in giving is hopeful. We give in the hope that the world will change and grow better, that it will be a more holy and just, whole and loving place. If events of recent days have taught us nothing, it's that that hope is in dire need of strengthening, of sharing, and of combining our work for it. As you give this morning, give in hope for the work that we might do. In Jesus' name, in this place, let us give with gladness.
gracious God, bless these tithes and offerings, the intentions of our hearts to the work of love and grace in our bruised, broken, and battered world. Make us your peacemakers, justice bringers, and hope givers in the days to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn is A Version of Amazing Grace. It is in your bulletin, and I invite you to remain standing and singing as you are willing and able. This book uh, is a book of poems my grandfather got in 1931. It has been something that I have uh, used on my first day at any appointment. And while this is not my last day, it is my last day in preaching. 
I think often of this poem, which my grandfather had highlighted, and I have revisited it, uh, particularly the end of Ulysses by Lord Tennyson. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, not to yield. It has been my blessing to serve as your pastor for anything I have done or left undone that caused you pain. I apologize, I repent, and I deeply regret it. It is my prayer that you will know that there is nothing that you can do or have done or have said that will cause me to think of you as anything less than beloved of the household of God, my brothers and sisters and companions in the faith, and welcome partners in building the reign of God everywhere that the Lord should take us. I thank you for the gift of your presence this year. Even with COVID, you have been a blessing to this community and to me. I will pray for you, I give thanks for you, and I will invite you as you are willing and able to do the same for me as I begin the next steps on my journey. If I cry back there, it's okay. You can too. But I just want to say deeply what a treasure it has been to be a part of this community. And I thank you for it. May God see us all safely to our next place, our next journey, and finally home. Go in peace. Amen.